Now moving on to our next topic on clearing the myths around dysbiosis. May I invite Dr. Samir Sadawarte sir and Dr. Ravi Tyagarajan sir on stage to chair the session. Dr. Samir Sadawarte is a practicing pediatrician intensivist at Fortis Hospital Mulund. Dr. Ravi Tyagarajan practicing pediatrician in Thane since 31 years also visiting pediatrician at Jupiter Hospital Thane. I request our chairperson to invite and introduce our speaker Dr. Uday Pai. Dr. Samir Starting with sir I'll It's my pleasure today to invite Dr. Uday Pai. Gut microbiome and its relation to human health is an extremely popular topic in current times and it's involved in inflammatory and metabolic GI disorders and it's also associated with infant health and longevity. It's a pleasure to hear Dr. Uday Pai speak on dysbiosis in children and clear our myths. Uday means to rise. I hereby request Dr. Uday Pai to rise on stage and enlighten and enliven us with his talk. Dr. Uday Pai, dysbiosis in children. Thank, thank you, Ravi, for those kind words. Thank you to the organizers, organizers for this extremely well-organized session. And of course, you know, gratitude to the scientific chairman because the instructions were so clear the communication was so clear and I think it was one of those ones, very ones with all the communications were subtle without too much of disturbance. Thank you very much to us. Thank you to all the committee members of team uh, Thana and of course very happy to be here today and talk to you. Thank you Ravi, thank you Samir. Disbiases and learning, I think you know we have a lot to learn from disbiases. And as we realize now, in, after such an interesting session on vaccination, I think, you know, the time has come where pediatricians have now realized that wellness is a bigger concept than illness. So, you know, the, the word ill is now shifting towards well. And so, you know, 50% of all that we do today is vaccine related and beyond that today is all health related. And in the last maybe two years during the lockdown, we realized that most of the patients actually asked us, what do I do to avoid something rather than what to do if I get something? And we realized that Parents today are now looking at scenario where staying healthy is going to be a bigger challenge than, you know, treating an illness. And with the illness, we realize that there's going to be a lot of anxiety related problems rather than anything else. And that's going to be the next thing in our... So let me, let us understand simple things first. I mean, we know that when we look at disbiases, we look at what are we looking at when we're looking at disbiases. So we are looking at gut microbiota and that's what is probably our understanding. And we have to remember that, you know, it is something which is inherent to us and we probably live with it, live through it and grow with it. So, yes, it's a collection of microbes which involves both commensal, symbiotic as well as pathogenic. So, I mean, we have to realize that what would be the role and what probably is something which we have to understand because it resides in our gut. Contains a huge number, it's more than 100 trillion of that. And we know that in spite of that, we have only two dominant phyla which we have to remember and we have to understand that which is related to bacteroids and those which are firmicutes. And multiple factors influence this composition. I mean, starting with birth, we know that the composition will differ in a caesarean born baby and a composition will differ in a provaginal born baby. So it's so different. And of course, we all understand that the theory is related to whatever changes happen to this particular gut microbiota are the reasons for understanding what is intestinal hypothesis for dysbiosis. So let's try to understand what is dysbiosis. And trying to understand dysbiosis basically is the same person who identified the role of, let's say, gut microbiome or gut microbiota, Mechnikov, who actually describes what alters gut microbiota. And anything which alters the gut microbiota either gives rise to a problem or solves a problem or keeps you healthy. So all the three parameters are something which we look at, we understand and we learn on a day-to-day -day basis. So what effects would it have when it changes this gut microbiome? And we realize that yes, the effects could be either because of quantity of what changes, quality which changes, 
and related metabolic activities or the distribution which changes the whole scenario. So anything which changes these associated conditions changes the integrity as well as multiple inflammatory cytokines and we all know the importance of IL factors, cytokine factors and multiple other factors in the gut which have a large potential to give rise to pathogenic problems and progression of metabolic conditions in future. There are a number of hosts which basically change and we realize that any of these change have a potential profound role to play in constraining what changes would give rise to quality as well as quantity of the microbiome. Now if changes can give rise to illness or changes can give rise to a problem, we have to basically go back to understand is if everything is fine, what is the issue? So anything which maintains a gut microbiome is basically something which is symbiosis and health. And in symbiosis we realize that there is something called as a gut brain wall of profound which takes place which changes from time to time. So we realize that normal intestinal microbiota, immune system and the brain function are totally ruled and this basically gives rise to a absolute synergy which keeps us healthy as well as in homeostasis. So when we talk of microbiota, what are the health functions which we, we look at immunomodulation which can be mucosal or systemic, gut based or gut microbiomes. Protection, we know that yes with all this being understood, what is the protective nature which probably gives rise? Yes, we know there is a physical barrier, production of antimicrobial substances, mucin generation and a host of other antimicrobial compounds which get protective in nature. Of course, integrity of the gut. Outside the gut, we all realize that a germ-free state is something which is extremely difficult with the environmental changes that we undergo every time. And this definitely is something which we understand now and are learning to understand that these changes will affect our day-to-day -day activities. Last but not the least, anything to do with nutrition and metabolism has now been well understood. And when we look at metabolism, we look at both diet-based changes with body weight or the effect of drugs. So if I am going to understand dysbiosis, I have got a degree to understand. We understand now four degrees. Normal gut is what we all basically would like, but if there is a reduction, that is quantitative reduction, we give rise to a lot of other bacteria to grow and change into an anaerobic condition. In addition to that, we also have that greater decrease will give rise to more and more difficult situations which we understand and that is how the grading will keep changing and give rise to dysbiosis. How do I classify dysbiosis? To classify dysbiosis, we categorize them into simple changes which are related to either deficiency, putrefaction, fermentative, susceptibility as well as generative of any of these changes giving rise to growth of fungus, giving rise to fungal dysbiosis. To understand deficiency, yes, it is a consequence of non-healthy diets and multiple antibiotic therapy which would probably change the gut microbiome and give rise to a deficiency in multiple digestive enzymes. Putrefactive, poor diet or a diet extremely rich in fat and meat, poor in fibers. The metabolization which of which can lead to extreme high production of ammonia, amines as well as phenols which would upset the gut microbiome. Fermenting. This is something which is very common and more age induced, not much seen in children but even today with the kind of food that the child takes or the kind of diet that the child takes, we are seeing a lot of these particular issues related to what we call as FODMAPs and that is what fermentable oligosaccharides with disaccharides, monosaccharides and polyols and all of this in diet would give rise to an extreme change in the gut microbiome giving rise to multiple conditions. Anything to do with susceptibility have got something related to genetic causes and these genetic changes which we see are seen very very commonly and probably progressively we realize that in a larger age group we see them coming out with more of these IBD and IBS syndromes which have led to multiple abnormal immune responses to most of the components which change in the gut microbiome. We also realize that the economic ec ec ecosystem with changes would give rise to an altered motility as well as bowel in inflammation because of which we realize that they either will come with diarrhea, multiple diarrhea or peristalsis 
excessive peristalsis or even changes which are responsible for bowel inflammation. Anything which changes the gut microbiome actually changes the immune system. And with that change we also realize that this change gives rise to growth or provocation of fungi. And we all know that if the immunomodulation or the gut microbiome is not able to give a protective barrier with fungal diastasis, we realize that possibility of candida or other fungi growing giving rise to multiple manifestations which will give rise to an upset in the digestive system. So once we understand the classification, once we realize what's the importance of gut microbiome, do we understand that this can come from multiple areas. So what causes this gut microbiome? Let's look at some simple things which happen or causes. Changes in motility, constipation or diarrhea, modifications of acidity actually affects the gut microbiome, the lactiflora as well as probably a lot of other commensals which are existing right from the oral cavity to the small intestine and upset of that will probably give rise to multiple other digestive problems. Reduction in production of protective bacteriostatic peptides, which is an extremely common thing. That's a mucin protection or protection of multiple complement factors, IL factors, which do give rise to changes in the cytokines within our system and make us vulnerable to problems which are related to disease related. In addition to that, alteration in mus mucus production as well as IgA secretion, multiple small ulcerations in the gut will give rise to uh, deficiency states which probably are related to nutrient absorptions or necrosis. Shift in gut microbiome, diseases which occur because of the intestinal damage, massive intake of antibiotics which is something which we have probably spoken about time and again and now we speak so much about rational practice of antibiotics that we have been able to say to health pediatrician that if you confidently diagnose something as viral, don't use antibiotics. So we are trying to come to situations where we have been able to counsel our own colleagues on what is the importance of why antibiotics are required and not required and what changes it will does. In addition to use, of course, there are other conditions where immunocompromised situations following chemotherapeutic agents and radiation exposure, prematurity, early transfer of artificial feeding, toxic, toxic, toxicosis from pregnancy and of course multiple other purulent conditions which may be of septic nature. Diet has been a major issue and we know today's children basically depend on a lot of packed food. So possibly consumption of a lot of harmful maybe chemicals which are also responsible for this kind of a situation, especially sulfur containing compounds, sulfites, sulfates, which actually allow growth of a lot of PPMs as well as production of potentially harmful bacteria in the gut and change the nature of normal gut microbiome. So here this summarizes that diet, antibiotics, multiple infections, stress do change the homeostasis in by reducing the beneficial bacteria, giving rise to a larger amount of pathobionts as well as loss of diverse diversity, which probably is responsible. Other factors which we also speak about, oxidative stress, bacteriophages, as well as bacteriosins, which probably are changed with nutrient drugs, immunity status, as well as in mucosa, which give rise to a change in commensal as well as gut microbiome giving rise to a situation. After speaking about what changes the commensal, does changing the commensal, either qualitative or competitive, give rise to disease? Only if I am able to relate that this particular change is going to give rise to a condition which is going to give rise to disease, would I be very interested in maintaining a good healthy microbiome? So what are the different conditions that dysbiosis would give rise to multiple pediatric diseases? Like we spoke about how symbiosis maintains a normal CNS, we know that anything to do with this would probably change the gut brain barrier. And abnormality in any of these particular structures will give rise to an imbalance which would probably give rise to both metabolic or non-metabolic problems. So if you look at some of the problems with prematurity, you would probably look at more and necrotizing enterocolitis in addition to late onset sepsis. Today we have seen that the role of IgA secretion in the gut is so important. So we have seen a lot of eczema related problems, asthma, food allergies and maybe type 1 diabetes. 
in metabolic conditions we see that yes there is a definite role which is played there is a change in the motility so irritable bowel syndrome or inflammatory bowel disease and of course lot of neuropsychiatric diseases as well as metabolic problems like obesity also others so yes multiple disorders have been implicated with change of gut microbiome so dysbiosis impacts multiple issues and all these basically make us look at trying to look and maintain what we say as something which we aim to do prevent dysbiosis restore the diversity as soon as possible and you realize it and of course that would probably improve all health outcomes and in addition to this rational use of antibiotics looking at use of concomitant maybe microbiomes along with antibiotics where we find that is a problem and right diet interventions especially in children at the right time would probably give a solution what effects would i see with we look at change in volume of gas produced so you look at gas based problems you look at breakdown of bile salts responsible for digestive compounds in the gut losing its impetus consistency and volume of issues like i said it may be constipation or loose motions and of course fermentation in the gut which may give rise to problems so what are the multiple conditions that we would look at yes the list is long but yes as we are looking two decades from where we launched probiotics as part of therapy these changes keep happening on a multiple level so we have change in international inter intestinal barrier impaired gut brain axis change of met metabolite production altered metabolite signaling and dysregulated immune response so all of which will probably give rise to all the others around it in a cloud of us antibiotic associated we spoke about we know that this is very common it's five times susceptibility we of course giving rise to multiple other issues and prolonged hospital stay gut related problems with gi related problems related to this most commonly inflammatory bowel disease which we see in later maybe 8 plus or 10 plus years it was more a uh, second or the third decade problem in the past now it is more a uh, problem in the younger age we are seeing this biases with an irritable bowel syndrome which has multiple factors the factors of shift of microbiome damaging the gut you are giving rise to a problem and these are well understood and well realized today and what was more a uh, higher age problem is now seen in pediatric issues and we are addressing it on a daily basis multiple metabolic problems especially related to obesity as well as type 2 diabetes and other situations conditions which probably give rise to gi disorders are getting well understood clostridium difficile infection which is a leading nosocomial infection affecting almost 50000 patients annually and a complex condition which needs to be addressed on a regular basis most of which are related to antibiotic changes and antibiotic related problems which have been seen very well so is there need for probiotics in treating of gut dysbiosis very very clear evidence based effects which have been proven very well but the important factors which you would probably come to notice here is they are all strain level and very well understood that strain specific species level which give rise to specific issues and of course widespread use of multiple probiotics have been understood today for metabolic conditions like obesity type 2 diabetes allergy eczema and multiple other things but for evidence based today in our clinical practice we know that it is for infectious diarrhea antibiotic associated diarrhea inflammatory bowel disease lactose intolerance and irritable bowel syndrome so very clearly we understand that any dysbiosis needs to be addressed with proper pro because it enhances the epithelial barrier function functional foods beneficial effects as well as iga and other problems keeping in mind probiotics and dysbiosis we know that probiotics demonstrate a potential to mitigate or eliminate inflammation we also understand with commensals it interacts with immune immune cells to give rise to a good immunomodulatory effect it inhibits angiogenesis and induces apoptosis regulates the transcription upregulation detoxify enzymes and experimental evidence proves that strain specificity has <coughs> potential to reduce the inflammation of guts and we realize that if we follow evidence based we are also in a situation to look at that beneficial effects are well understood so by which 
we know very clearly that if we practice health or wellness as a concept, we are probably going to understand the need to use probiotics in conditions which are fully based by scientific literature and data to promote our healthiness in children. Thank you very much for a patient here. Hello. Uh, thank Dr. Uday Pai. Uh, it's very good, elaborate talk. You talk about the microbiota, reasons uh, why these viruses happen, how it happens and what are the strategy. Because we have to get in the, the vicious cycle was happening between disease and these viruses and these viruses causing again a disease. So thanks very much for today's uh, your elaborate talk and uh, I hope people will like this sessions very well. Any questions there or we'll take it afterwards. So no questions, we'll uh, wind up this session. Th thank you. Thank you, thank Sunil. You, thank you, Ravi. Thank you, team Capricorn. May I request Dr. Samir Sadawate to felicitate Dr. Uday Pai. Thank you, sir. On behalf of TAP, we felicitate Dr. Ravi Tyagrajan. And Dr. Samir Sadawarte. Thank you, sir.